That is not dead, which can eternal lie. And with strange eons, a podcast shall rise. H.P. Lovecraft, Weird Tales, Ramsey Campbell, Cthulhu, Laird Baron, Silent Hill, Brian Lumley, Dagon. There's something sinister out there in the cosmos, and the tendrils run deep throughout the universe. Only one woman dares to traverse the web. Mary San Giovanni, who once again is up to cosmic shenanigans. Hi folks, welcome once again to Cosmic Shenanigans. I'm your host, Mary San Giovanni, up to shenanigans, as always, of cosmic proportions. This week, I'm kind of excited to talk about a short story called The Things by Peter Watts. Uh, This story originally appeared in Clark's World in 2010. It has gone on to become a 2011 Hugo Award nominee, 2010 BSFA Award finalist, 2010 Shirley Jackson Award winner, 2011 finalist, the Locus Award for Best Short Story, and the 2011 Theodore Sturgeon Award nominee. So we're talking about a pretty awesome short story, which has been analyzed and uh, discussed by uh, minds far greater and and more uh, academic than mine. But I'm going to give it a shot in terms of talking about its cosmic horror significance. What the story is, is a sequel to The Thing by John Carpenter. Now, if you're familiar with Cosmic Shenanigan past episodes, we have discussed John Carpenter's The Thing and its cosmic horror implications. Uh, that movie takes place from the point of view of several men in the Antarctic uh, at a uh, research outpost who discover... I should say that they have almost thrust upon them a discovery made by a nearby Norwegian camp of an alien in the alien spaceship. And it turns out that this alien is a shapeshifter that gets into people and assimilates their cells and takes over. And that this entity is both a whole and individual parts at the same time. And that this is how it functions. A little piece of it is enough to be an entity that, given time can, you know, grow to be a significant force. So uh, the story is so brilliant in that it looks at uh, themes of paranoia and trust and survival and the idea of a human being's individuality and autonomy as being uh, significant. But in the grand scheme of a horror that uh, has conquered untold worlds. Because we do get the impression, both from the short story it's based on, Who Goes There, by John Campbell, and also from the movie, that there are cosmic implications, far-reaching galactic implications for what this creature is. Now, in The Things, what we're seeing is the same story but from the point of view of the alien itself. And because we are seeing it from this point of view, it is both a sympathetic creature and a terrifying one. It is a tragic and horrifying situation that this being finds itself in. And one of the sad things about it is it's inability at first or for a long time to understand the nature of the creatures that it has come in contact with. And one could be said, you know, one could say the same about cosmic horror in general, that the true horror is the utterly alien nature of the force that human beings come in contact with that is almost impossible to understand. It's impossible to understand their you know, biological makeup, their chemical makeup, their psychological makeup. It, it, it's, it's so foreign and alien 
that part of what makes us insignificant is our inability to understand these greater truths, these greater differences. And what we have here, again, is this, this portrayal of alien psychology. And in doing research for this, I've seen it mentioned, I believe it was on Tor.com, uh, where you know a, a regular column I've made reference to in the past discusses cosmic horror. Um, as a thoughtful, quote, thoughtful exploration of religion and the missionary impulse. If you think of it like that, if you attribute to the thing, the alien, uh, and uh, what it believes to be an altruistic uh, approach, that it is driven by faith and passion and the desire to share as it sees sharing the beauty and the secrets of the cosmos of countless worlds with these humans that it makes it even sadder that it is in the situation that it's in. The fact that it can't get past that as occasionally missionaries can't they cannot either accept or are unwilling to accept that the people that they are um, it, it buried witness to are unwilling recipients of this information. Uh, there is something sort of, I think, sort of sad there. But basically what we have is, is the cosmic horror, but from the opposite point of view. Like it's almost a flip. It's the same kind of cosmic horror in some ways, but it's a mirror image of that cosmic horror in terms of now the insignificance not only being put on human beings, but even on the things that human beings are afraid of. We have the horror of this monster being small. It feels lesser somehow, because even though it is the kind of creature that can exist separately and its consciousness can be spread to all the individual parts of itself, every time one of those little parts is destroyed, it loses something. It loses a piece of itself, a sense of itself. It loses memories. It loses knowledge that it had before. And it's got to take the time to rebuild itself in order to remember those things. So what we have is a being that at full capacity would be an elder god. Something, uh, something that carries the secrets of countless worlds from countless galaxies that can take on the shape of all of these beings that it has interacted with in the past, that it understands the biology and the psychology and the spiritualism of thousands, maybe even millions of different alien species all over the universe, that it carries that kind of godlike power with it but here in a tiny little f dark and frozen bitter little outpost of a faraway world in a faraway galaxy part of it has been destroyed in the crash uh, what's left of it managed to crawl into the ice it fell asleep for so long that even if it had understood the planet then it certainly doesn't now and it doesn't understand the things which keep attacking it for just trying to share this wealth of knowledge with them. It has lost connection to countless worlds and shapes and understanding, and it's lost connection to parts of itself that may still be out there, you know, uh, assimilating other worlds. Another thing I think is tragic, as I mentioned, is it's, and this is either, it's not a lack of intellect. It may be a stubbornness, but for much of the story, it's inability to understand until it's too late this sort of bleak truth that humans are frail. They only get one body and they only get one chance at life, as far as this creature sees them, that Everything they have, everything that they are contained in is in this one body and in one spot of one body. When it first tries to assimilate, it understands that it can't access their memories 
from someplace lower in the body, like the stomach or the chest. Even though it would expect that every cell of every body does the say it, it does multiple functions, like in its own body, it finds that it's only when it accesses the brain what it considers a tumor, a tumorous growth in the heads of these beings, that it can understand anything at all, including language or uh, feelings or. You know, and it and it does assimilate slowly. So there is a part of the people still left in there while it's assimilating, and those people are hostile. They're angry toward it. They're not embracing this as the gift that the alien is intending it to be. Um, it it finds tragedy in the thought that what survival means to the to the thing, the alien, is adaptation and assimilation. That that is that is how survival works. That is survival of the fittest. That adaptation and assimilation brings the universe together and and gives us the power of creation in a way. Um, but for human beings, individualism and autonomy is survival. And it can't understand that. And that's one of the sad things, too. In, in Cosmic Car, we've often talked about how individualism is almost a moot point in the face of these, these cosmic monstrosities. But we never see it quite as clearly as we do here that this odd concept of names, of naming individual parts, which the thing can't quite understand. It says in the beginning, I, I am being Blair, I am being Childs, I am being Copper. Um, but it's, it finds that these names are only helpful in terms of keeping track of how the humans see those different incarnations. It doesn't understand that these pieces are uh, these these individual pieces are not pieces of a whole; that they're not sharing information with each other. And even that, it finds sad because it uh, it, it understands the concept of paranoia and mistrust between these beings is because they can't communicate with each other the way the thing can communicate with other parts of the thing. And there is, I mean, there is something sort of sad about that, but there's also, I think, this idea of absorption is terrifying to human beings. We need our individualism and our autonomy to feel that we have importance in the universe. And what this alien is basically saying is that countless worlds in the universe have given up their sense of individualism and autonomy to become part of this greater whole, whether they wanted to or not. And that this this massive network, which the thing in the story calls communion, is much, much greater than this, this one little planet that fights and uh, fights for this individual life, this individual uh, small piece of, of biomass and its attendant memories and thoughts. Uh, another, you know, another analysis of the story said that the narrator is overwhelmed by loneliness and the futility of the thing's lives. And this is pretty, pretty true. As an entity it can reach feelers out and put many pieces of itself into many individual biomasses, organisms. Um, But there's a sense of, I guess, communication between those things. And it feels that having communed with other beings, that it has connected itself to the universe, that it has established itself as significant in the universe. And it doesn't understand that the things, the human beings, um, they fight their whole lives. Um, they're violent. They lash out at anything that they perceive as a threat. But it's because they're so used to pain that life stuck in one body in an environment that they're not perfectly suited for They don't adapt. Human beings force the world around them 
to adapt to them as opposed to having the biological capabilities of simply adapting to other environments. And it finds that rigidness, that stubbornness, um, is constantly causing them pain, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. So their whole lives are built on pain, and yet they still fight to hold on to that life for as long as possible. And what we're seeing through the eyes of this thing in a cosmic horror sense is the futility of that. The futility of a life of pain that just keeps going until suddenly it doesn't. Uh, when these things die, then they cease to be connected to anything as far as the thing is concerned. So it does, again, I think diminish the individual accomplishment of, you know, living well, even. That there is no living well. Um, and it decides, it has, at the point of the story that the things takes place would be toward the end of the movie. And, you know, here there's spoilers here, but it considers itself um, being childs. It hasn't fully assimilated childs yet. And so the part of childs that is still childs, the thoughts and memories that are still childs, hate it. Uh, they, it, it, it the, the child's part says that uh, it's a kind of rapist. And although the thing doesn't understand what the word means, it does understand that this is a violent, uh, a violent act, an act that is... Um, an intrusion that is an invasion and it understands the hatred behind that um, but yet it thinks it thinks of human beings as, as sort of savages that it will that in order to give life, their life lives meaning uh, it needs to essentially as, as it puts it it needs to to you know, rape this communion into them by attacking and assimilating them. And at the end of the movie, if, if you have seen the movie, you see that um, one of the greatest ends of a horror movie is this idea that the creatures, you know, if, if, the, if the creature is in either McCready or Child's, neither one of them, the other one doesn't know it. And we are left in the movie with that sense of ambiguity because both of them are freezing to death. And there is not going to be a happy ending there. The camp around them is on fire. There is no place for the thing to hide except to go back into the snow until the plane comes to get them. And basically you have a... Uh, a sense of this um, th this futility of even just sitting it out and just waiting it out but what the uh, what you see then I think is uh, that tr mistrust that that sense of holding on to any individual sense of self to fight again for the thought, uh, you know, to fight again for the idea of uh, autonomy or life, just to hold on to what life is left, is not worth the effort. And so they're just going to let it go. They're just going to let it go and see what happens. And in the things, what uh, the creature as childs is encountering is that the parts that are still childs because it hasn't had time yet to fully assimilate all of the biomass that is childs. The parts that are still childs are dying. They are freezing to death. And if they do that, the thing will not be strong enough to keep going through such a difficult terrain. Now it won't die. The creature itself won't die. It can go back into the ice and, and just sleep. It can, produce a kind of antifreeze that will keep its cells from exploding. But um, 
but it is starting to feel, I think, a sense of what human beings feel. Because it comes to realize that these individual parts can be significant in various ways. MacReady is clearly a leader that uh, although MacReady has the most hostility toward it, um, it is also, in a way, the thing admires MacReady because things that should have killed it, should have killed MacReady, didn't. They tried to freeze him out, and, and he still came back. And, uh, you know, things attacked it, things attacked him, and he still fought them off, that he's very resourceful. And I think there's, there's a sense of admiration as much as fear, because he knows that MacReady is the major threat of all these individual things on this planet. MacReady is the most threatening, and yet there is there is a sense of admiration there because if the thing is ever going to understand the human psychology of being limited to one body, one shape, one set of experiences, one lifetime, that in understanding why that's worth fighting for, he would have to understand MacReady. And so you have this moment at the end where... Uh, he encounters, as child, he encounters MacReady, and they sit and talk. And he recognizes that MacReady is dying too, that he is freezing to death, and that the two of them aren't going anywhere. And I think it's only then that he recognizes a certain uh, kinship, maybe, with human beings and that he's alone too. The thing is alone too. Uh, that it, you know, it wants to survive as well. And that it is lonely. It's alone. It's left alone and, and it's scared and it's, uh, sad. It's sad that there is nothing left for it, that it failed in a way. And that it wants to be a part of something bigger, a part of something greater again. It wants to commune with human beings. And much like what human beings do, human beings will hold on to a reason to feel significant, a reason to keep going, uh, a reason to fight for that little bit of life that they have. And what the thing realizes is that its fight, its reason to keep going, its reason to survive, is to share the most beautiful experience it knows, to share the most uh, secure and peaceful and calming and reaffirming experience that it knows. It's got to keep assimilating. It's got to keep absorbing. It's got to keep taking over the human race. And it's that thought that it leaves us with that even if it has to force that on people, that's what it's going to do. So again, what I think what we see here in terms of cosmic horror is, is not only that it is, you know, based on works of cosmic horror that have come before it and serving as something of, you can't really say it's a sequel. I guess it's a you know, it happens sort of in tandem with the movie. But you're seeing the idea that, and we've discussed this before in cosmic, uh, cosmic horror, you know, movies and things in the past, that when even the gods are scared, when even the gods feel small and insignificant and lonely and lost, then what does that even mean for the human race that doesn't have those abilities? What does it even mean for what it considers lesser entities uh, if, if the universe out there is so big and so indifferent or hostile uh, and, and dangerous that even the gods are scared? I think that's the, that's the cosmic horror of this story. It's beautifully written. It's brilliantly done. It deserves the awards it's won. And it has a little special place, I think, in my heart because it, it deals with, I think, the alien psychology of this. It deals with the other, 
which Lovecraft is frequently talked about. Um, and, you know, in terms of embracing the other, which you could read into Lovecraft's work as either he was finally understanding that being the other was okay, or he was reaffirming the idea that giving up and accepting your otherness is a horror in and of itself. Either way you look at it, I think, that's what we have here. We have a sense of the other that is terrified because it doesn't understand why it's hated and it doesn't understand why these beings are rejecting the gift that it thinks it's giving them. And also this resignation, or I shouldn't say it's it resignation so much as a renewed effort to be the other and to force the otherness on human beings. Because even then, even at the end, even as much as it's come to understand about um, individualism, what it sees individualism as is a torturous kind of loneliness. What it sees as autonomy is a curse and a tragedy. And it comes to find that only through obliterating any sense of individual human significance can human beings ever find happiness. And it is obdurately, obstin I'm sorry, obstinately uh, going to cling to this. It is stubbornly going to cling to the idea that this cannot, you know, that this cannot be any other way. Um, so that's, that's it for this week. If you have not read it, you can still find the things um, posted to the, the online sections of Clark's World. It's a great story by Peter Watts. Uh, I recommend checking it out. If you enjoyed this episode of Cosmic Shenanigans, you might enjoy past and present and future episodes. You can go to Brian Keen Radio slash podcast, briankeen.com, and you can find all the episodes there, you know, linked, linked from there. You can advertise with us if you'd like by um, contacting Matt Wilderson through that link. And if you enjoy this, you may also enjoy another podcast that I co-host, The Horror Show with Brian Keene, also available through the briankeen.com uh, podcast slash radio page where you can you know link to, link, link to the different shows from there too. So anyway, that's it for this week. Hope you enjoyed the episode and I will see you next week. Bye. Cosmic Shenanigans is a production of the Brian Keene Radio Network. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. Cosmic Shenanigans is written and produced by Mary San Giovanni. Our theme music is by Xander Harris. Our engineer is Matt Wilderson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. If you enjoyed this show, you might enjoy our other podcasts, The Horror Show with Brian Keene, Defender's Dialogue, and Grindcast. To advertise on Cosmic Shenanigans, visit briankeen.com and click Podcasts. <laughs>